How's it going on you mentees? Uncanny Omar here from Near Mint Condition, the home of Collected Editions. And join me today for an overview of these trade paperbacks that have come out recently from Dark Horse Comics. So let's go ahead and get started. Alright, before getting started, I do want to thank the kind folks at Dark Horse for sending us copies of these trade paperbacks. All of these books have already come out in the direct market and the book market. Now, before I go any further, I do hope that you all are hitting the like button and subscribe it if you haven't subscribed yet. We put out videos every day. So we have a different set of books this time around. Uh, Powers Volume 3, Carmilla, which I've been wanting to read for a long time now, ever since I heard about it. And... Whenever I do these, I always do a near mint condition seal of approval on my favorite read out of the batch of books that I've gotten. And sometimes it's really hard because I've enjoyed a couple of these, but, but I did limit it to just one. As always, if you want to jump around, if you're just interested in a couple of titles, the description of the video has the timestamps with the titles of the books. In case you're just interested in one or two, if you're interested in all of it, I hope you watch the whole video. All right, so let's go ahead and start with Carmilla. Carmilla, the first vampire, or Carmilla, right? Maybe, depending on where you're from. Uh, written by Amy Chu and drawn by Sue Lee. This is a really interesting take on the character of Carmilla. Now, I will be honest with you, I found out about the character through the Vampire Hunter D. Bloodlust movie. That movie is sold. That is a beautiful piece, by the way. That movie, oh my gosh, it's late 90s. And I did, and that's when I first read uh, Sheridan Lefanu's um, Carmilla. So that's a character that predates, of course, Dracula. She was the first literary vampire. And yeah, this is an interesting take on that story. But also mixing in a lot of Asian culture and folklore in here. And I think it's done really well. This, if you notice, is part of the Burger line of books. So it's Burger Books, which, interesting in the afterwards, uh, Amy Chu talks about how she was approached by Karen Berger to write this story. So I thought that was really cool that Karen approached Amy Chu. Now, if Amy Chu comes from the world, or at least that I know of, is her Red Sonja work. She, uh, she wrote Red Sonja. It was right after Gail Simone's run. So in this particular story, we meet the character of Athena. She's this young lady living in New York City. This takes place in 1996, and she's working as a social worker. And one of her clients goes missing, and as it turns out, they start finding dead bodies of missing girls throughout New York City in this particular year. So she starts going and investigating on her own, trying to find where these missing girls are, what exactly is going on. Uh, she lives with uh, her girlfriend right here. This is Morgan. And one night she makes it all this way to this nightclub. And that's kind of where the name of Carmilla takes place. It's this kind of re-envisioning of the character. But it's done as a nightclub where a bunch of uh, gay men and gay women go and hang out. So this is where everything has led to. So she's there asking about one of the missing girls and she ends up meeting this girl named Veronica. Now she believes she is being followed throughout the city and she keeps telling herself that she does not believe in monsters, that they are not real. So... She ends up waking up next to, I love this part right here, to her, I believe it's pronounced Yeye, and I believe this uh, is how you pronounce it. I'm not 100% sure. If you know, please let me know. But this is her grandfather. And I love the relationship she has with her grandfather. Her grandfather tells her all the folklore. So there is a lot of that Chinese folklore that I remember that I learned through just watching a bunch of horror movies. Uh, for example, let me just show you. This is Veronica. And Veronica ends up playing a big part in Athena's life. But and let me show you exactly what I mean. So, for example, her and Veronica are watching this movie. And Veronica's like, what is this? This is funny. Like, what, what is this creature? And this right here is a Jungzi, I believe is how you pronounce it. But it's like a mixture of like vampire and zombies. If you play Darkstalkers, then you know the character of Sienko, where she hops on the ground. It's pretty much, or at least what I remember from the movies, that 
it's the ground is so hot because they're dead and they can't step on it that's why they hop I'm not sure why i'm doing that with my fingers so the more that she dives into these missing girls the more it reveals this whole underground world and this character of veronica may or may not be a big part of this world and the name carmilla of the nightclub may not j just be for the nightclub so she a lot of things start hitting personal uh, people that she knows start going missing, so something is really going on, and she could have let like this dark force into her life. And of course, coincidentally enough, it's also when Veronica first appeared. This is definitely a page turner, and speaking of pages, this one only has 112 pages. I wish that was about the only thing I was going to say. I wish this had been longer. I really enjoyed this. It was a real good page turner. I like the whole mystery aspect, and I like the modern take on the character of Carmilla. Now, the only thing that threw me back is this right here. If this takes place in 1996, these cell phones are way too fancy for 1996. I'm just going to say, maybe New York was a different world back then, uh, but I remember the big cell phones when... <laughs> <laughs> they were out here in the even in the late 90s they were huge but this is the way the cell phones look i don't know but that's the only th i mean we had beepers in 96 but they had uh phones like that so i found that the only thing to be unbelievable about this whole story all the way in the back is where you're gonna find the bios on the two creators amy chu and suli i'm sorry i left out sal cipriano he does the lettering here is a letter from Amy Chu, and then the character designs back here. The supplemental sketches, the thumbnail sketches to final page layout, and then other burger books back here. 112 pages and retailing for $19.99. And I'm sure you probably noticed, but just in case, the size. It's a little bit shorter than your average trade paperback. It's about the same length, but just not as tall as the trade paperbacks. And, you know, it really makes it stand out on your shelf. Next up is the second volume of Air. And I've done an overview of the first volume, and I want to say even flipping through here it might spoil some of that first volume. So if you haven't read the first one, and you don't want to know anything about this one, then maybe skip to the next book. Uh, if you don't care about spoilers, then whatever, then I am going to talk a little bit about what ended up happening in the first volume. This one here retails for $19.99. You may have seen already that this is part of the Burger books, and this one has 128 pages. So this is volume two called Flying Machine, written by G. Willow Wilson, and M.K. Parker is the artist. The colorist is Chris Chuckery, and the lettering is Jared Fletcher. So this is... An introduction here by G. Willow Wilson talking about the ideas of where it came from uh, for the character that is about to appear in here. And then we kick it off with chapter one of, I guess, what would be known as season two of Air. So Air is pretty much the story of Air Stewardess Blythe. And she ends up finding herself in the previous volume, without going too much into details, in a strange conspiracy Pretty much just involving global capitalism, airplane disappearances, uh, disappearances of people, a, a country that doesn't exist anywhere on the map, and then throw in some Aztec uh, lore in there, and that's kind of where you get this particular volume. This is where it leaves off. Uh, pretty much, the first volume was Letters from Lost Countries, and that's what happened. She ended up falling in love with this guy named Zane. Zane writes her a letter, and she realizes, wait a minute, this country doesn't exist. What is this place where he's writing from? So in this, it kind of picks up immediately after that. She ends up getting saved by none other than Amelia Earhart. And I love the fact that she just keeps freaking about. Wait. The Amelia Earhart? How? How are you alive? What's going on exactly? So this is a really strange turn for the book because I love the whole mystery about the, in the this made-up country. Is it part of this conspiracy that this country doesn't exist? Who exactly is Zane? Is he a traveler from another dimension? This one here goes and I guess throws you for a curveball a little bit. Uh, there's talks of time travel, reality warping, and what role exactly Blythe may play in all of this. 
But the I want to say the biggest curveball to me in this particular volume is that found in the final issue that almost feels like a standalone story. Because everything else here is talking about Blythe, her connection to Amelia Earhart, trying to find Zane, a little bit of, uh, yeah, yeah, we'll say time travel. But it's not until you get to the final issue that takes place in 1063 AD. And this is all part of the Aztec kingdom right here. We get to see new characters, but these new characters provide a little bit of what will happen later on. So when I thought like I had some things figured out in the first volume, this second volume made me think, oh, I really don't know where this story is going. And I'm a little bit lost more than I was towards the beginning. But I like that. I like that it has this really weird tone to it. So I've been a fan of this one. I really like the artwork. Um, volume 1 almost got my seal of approval, just like this volume. I, I like the whole mystery aspect of the book. So if you've not read it, it was originally published by Vertigo, I want to say. Some of my viewers told me. Um, no, it was. I'm sorry. And I think they did three volumes. So I think that's all they're going to reprint. So the third volume will be out sometime this summer. But again, this is air all the way in the back. Or just bios on the creators from the opposite page of the ending. So I don't want to spoil that for anybody. So here we are with a beautiful cover, Air Book 2. Here we go with Pearl Volume 3 from the creators of Jessica Jones. That's right. They were part of the um, alias, as it was known at the time. I, first of all, I want to talk about this cover. I love this cover. It is absolutely stunning. The whole cover has a flat tone to it, with the exception of the word pearl except in the back right here this has a glossy finish and so does the word pearl right there here's the spine which we'll take a closer look together and it feels like the spine has embossed yeah the letters are embossed so volume three and yeah that cover my gosh that is absolutely stunning so this is really cool because this is the first time the stories in here have been collected these were previously released i believe by DC at the time when he was publishing his works at DC but now they're being collected over here at Dark Horse and for the first time the stories found in here from season 3 or I guess series 3 issues 1 through 6 are collected in this particular book so we're diving a little deeper into the character of Pearl so Pearl Tanaka we were introduced to her in the first volume and she gets to find out a little more about her mother in the first volume and then her whole ordeal with the Yakuza, what exact role she has to play, what exact role her family had to uh, play in there. So all of this written by Brian Michael Bendis, drawn by Michael Gatos. And I will be honest, Gatos' artwork to me, I've, I've never been a big fan of. I know that, uh, that sounds blasphemous to a lot of people that love Alias. We're big fan of his run on Alias and really enjoyed his work over on Daredevil. Yeah, and I have followed him, but for some reason, I, you know, I know that he uses a light box, for example, from time to time, because these are based on real people. Like the, he uses models, and sometimes that can be a little off-putting for me. But there was just something about the color blend that he used in this particular volume, and the artwork, the lines, the really thick lines that I just. I'm in, man. It's that's absolutely beautiful. I love the mixture of colors, and I love the mixture of, I guess, photorealistic artwork. I mean, this really looks like two people talking to each other and him just drawing lines on them. Uh, but it's a lot more complex than that. So he does everything for this. He does the, he does not only the colors, but I believe he also does the inks, the finished inks, if I'm not mistaken. Everything but the letters. The letters are done by Joshua Reed. And then, I'm sorry, the tattoo design is done by Diego Martin. Exotics Alex is the model for Pearl, so he does use models, like I mentioned. So, back to the main story. This is mature content, and Pearl dives deeper now into what role her father played and what ended up happening to her mother. Meanwhile, detectives and private investigators are trying to find out who exactly is the ghost dragon of San Francisco. And does the ghost dragon have any ties to Pearl. So that's what this one is without going too far or too much into spoilers. I think this one has phenomenal artwork. Like that is a beautiful piece right there. All right, let's look at the extras. 
So on the opposite page of the standard edition cover, sometimes there are variant covers. For example, there's volume two variant cover, but I did say, let's look at the back. So back here, we have some other variant covers. This is the inside front cover art for each issue. Then you have the sketchbook. And then he talks a little bit about the behind the scenes of how he does some of the artwork, like putting two drawings together through the computer. Uh, this book right here has 128, or I'm sorry, 68 pages. And it retails for $24.99. Next up is one of the most weirdest reads I had out of this batch, but I was so looking forward to it uh, whenever I saw the cover. And just based on this, I could tell that I was going to enjoy it. I will say I ended up enjoying it for a completely different reason instead of like, it didn't make me laugh, I'm not going to lie. But man, this was a really deep and a little bit darker read than I was expecting. I love the use of the characters here like Hippie and Herbert and Irma. I wanted Tony the Troll and Gurgle. Gurgle, speaking of. All right, so what exactly is this book about? Um, well... Right off the bat, oh, by the way, this is all written by James Asmus, I forgot, and Jim Fastante, and then Abile Kusinov is the artist. The cover is done by Benjamin Dewey, though. So, Survival Street is this really interesting story about how corporate America has kind of taken over America, and it happened in the span of just a few years. So, this kind of gives you a timeline of when companies ended up taking over like the political parties and ended up just pretty much cutting out all politicians and just running America by themselves. And in just a matter of two years, they decided, or I'm sorry, the new legislative decided that they pretty much wanted to terminate every public service, land and utility, and then transferring those assets to their businesses and pretty much running them for profit. So one of the things that they of course canceled was the public access network and the show that was on there and this is uh, salutation street which has been renamed to survival street so that was in 2028 when that happened or uh when yeah they send in a bunch of uh, people to go in and take them down and then the puppets decided to fight back so that's what they've been doing from 2028 to 2031 so even though the concept is really funny, this is really more of a social commentary on what's happening, right? About rights, and it's not really in your face about it. That's what I enjoyed. But I love the idea of these puppets just fighting back. Like, that. this timeline is what really, like, sucked me in. Because I thought, oh, this is not what I was thinking this book was going to be about. I thought it was just going to be... a you know, a story about puppets coming to life and getting revenge for people canceling their shows. No, it's a, it's definitely a satire. But like I said, it hits very close to home from time to time. Um, so here you get to find the different characters that are fighting back. Uh, you get to meet Herbert. You get to meet Birdie, who's kind of like the ringleader. You get to meet Gurgle, Tony the Troll. There's Hippie. And all of them have their own little special unique things about them. And there's Irma. Now, not all the puppets are siding with other puppets. Some of them have sold out to the corporate world. And it's interesting how that dynamic works between puppets. And yeah, this was a really good book. And I don't want to spoil it by saying too much. Other than, I mean, if the premise at all interests you, you should definitely check it out. Because it is... While it is funny, there are moments that I did crack up. It is a pretty dark, yet believable kind of scenario. What could be happening, you know, considering all the corporations takeovers. And, you know, we've heard about this for years, right? Buying politicians left and right. But this collects issues one through four of Survival Street. Uh, it does close nicely, so it does end. I don't know if there's any more, if there's talk of any more issues of this let's look in the back here for some extras so in the back we have some of the covers 
collected back here. This one has 120 pages and retails for $19.99. And then we have character designs right here. Corporal Punishment. And a birdie puppet. They actually made a birdie puppet. And it has come to be that part of the video where we show off the spines and where I remind people to hit the like button, please. If you haven't subscribed yet, think about subscribing. We put out videos every day. So here are all the spines of the book. I love the difference in them. You know, whenever it's a burger book, they have the burger symbol down there. It's very nice. And then, of course, the Dark Horse logo. All right, let's keep going with the overviews. The Lonesome Hunters, book one. This collects the Lonesome Hunters 1 through 4. This book retails for $19.99. And it was, I believe, a comicsology original. No, it's a graphic novel. Horror. And, uh, yeah, definitely horror, but not what I was expecting. So, when I opened this up... By the way, Tyler Crook does absolutely everything in this book. The script, the art, and the lettering. My goodness, that is an amazing feat. And... Okay, so when I open this up, it's all about uh, this young boy right here named Howard, who a hundred years ago ended up with a sword. His father gives him a sword, and the sword turns out to be stolen. So they're about to go and just take out some devil worshippers. And his father's like, look, I gave you that sword. It is your destiny. And, you know, the rest of what could be considered his church, his cult, or his group... They all believe that he is destined to be something special because of said sword. And keep in mind, the sword was stolen. So they go in there and pretty much his father and the entire group of people that he was with get slaughtered. Right? And he is off to face this demon alone with the sword. And you don't really get to see exactly what happens. All you know is that he comes out of the rubble and he has the sword with him. Now through the narrative, you get to find out that the sword is pretty much magical of course and it grants people powers some say immortality some say that you can live a long life and howard ended up getting old this is a hundred years later really old and he never really picked up the sword to fight any demons again or at least from what we were told in the first volume and you find out that the narrative is not really told through his perspective but it's told through the perspective of this young lady right here so she starts off with Howard had a stolen sword and I had a stolen watch. This is Lupe, who ended up stealing her this watch from her uncle, who he himself stole off a homeless person. So she greets Howard. She ends up meeting him uh, at the apartment complex where her uncle lives. And he's like, where's my watch? Anyway, this big crow ends up coming through the window. And it takes over his body. So she doesn't know what to do. So she goes and gets Howard. And Howard, you know, knowing a little bit about the dark side of things, says, okay, I need you to go and get this little box in my kitchen for me. And she's like, what? You want me to go get a box? And she's like, yes, do it. And he, she goes and gets this box. And this box is a magical box that he can pretty much store anything in. So she gives him the box. And she's like, look, that bird is taking over my uncle. And he's like, yeah, your uncle is dead. We got to get rid of that bird because that bird is pretty powerful. And it might be really hard to kill it. So this is where he pulls this magical sword out of this box. And I love these covers by Crook. They are just amazing. So now it's up to him and Lupe to figure out exactly what these demons want from him obviously they want the watch right the uncle stole the watch from some body probably a demon and they want it back so now it's up to both of them to kind of put a stop to this what i really enjoyed about this book is the character of howard because he's not your stereotypical i'm an old man and i used to be a bounty hunter i was a badass bounty hunter no he was kind of a coward he kind of got this sword by mistake he watched all his, you know, his father and all his group of people get killed and slaughtered. And he never really picked up the sword. So he wasn't really good at demon hunting. And he kind of grew up with that, you know, with the weight of that on his shoulders. And now he's older. So he's not like an experienced demon hunter. 
He just happens to be an old guy that has a magic sword, and that magic sword might be able to stop these demons from taking over the world. That's what I liked about this. Uh, this one has a mature rating on it. It has 120 pages retailing for $19.99. I cannot recommend this one high enough. I, I am so in on this. It's only collecting the first four issues, so I'm hoping that more comes out. I, I don't see or hear enough people talk about this. This was such a good read. This is getting the near main condition seal of approval. Absolutely. Uh, just because, first of all, the artwork. Oh my gosh. We're talking about Harrow County artist Tyler Crook, right? He co-created Harrow County. This is just as beautiful. I would love to see... Yeah, I'm already jumping the gun here, right? A complete collection of all this collected in a big, beautiful library edition one day. But this is definitely one not to be missed. All the way in the back... You do have character sketches and some page layout and him talking about how he started this journey in 2012. He didn't know exactly what to do with the character. All he knew was it's going to be featuring Howard. He was an old man. And here we are with the Lonesome Hunters. 100% recommending this one. Great read. Next up is Ask for Mercy Volume 1. This one here has 312 pages and retails for $29.99. So this is the one that was the Comixology exclusive first. Uh, this is presented by Comic Craft. So we have Richard Starkings here. And Richard Starkings, of course, comes from the world of Elephant Man. And this is all about this young lady named Mercy, who's a real estate agent. I love the fact that they keep going to that word, real estate. I have to mention the artist, Abigail Jill Harding, and she does the arts and the colors, and I'm just going to jump the gun a little bit here and say, oh my gosh, is the artwork freaking gorgeous in this? Absolutely stunning. I, I've never seen anything by her, but man, this is really good. And what this collects is seasons one and two. So in this particular story, this, by the way, collects Ask for Mercy seasons one and two. And like I said, they were original comicsology books. So we meet the character of Mercy, who, like I said, was a real estate agent. And she is greeted by this man right here. This is Ali Zarin. And he's like, hey, why don't you come with me? Even though he's got these creepy fingers, like, like demonic fingers, She's like, yeah, okay, that sounds like a good idea. I'll follow you through this gate that I've never noticed until yesterday. And he's like, what are you talking about? It's always been here. Of course you only noticed it yesterday. So she follows him to this really weird world where she is greeted by a couple of other characters. Uh, Rat Mirror, who just goes as Rat, Casa, and Budgie. And then she notices that a bunch of planes start attacking her, so she starts running away. Very north by northwest kind of scene here. And the planes start making sounds and they start turning. And they start turning into these demonic creatures. So she realizes that they're demons. And they're like, hey, Budgie, go ahead and take care of this one. And, she, and then she, <laughs> Budgie's like, yeah, I'll take care of this. So Budgie turns into this demon and starts ripping these other demons apart. Meanwhile, she's like, what exactly is going on? So Mercy is just confused as to what is happening. And as she finds out is that she ends up getting called to join this team of mon uh, monster hunters. And what they're trying to do is stop the pretty much the Nazis from summoning a bunch of demons to take over the world. So it's not just Nazis that she's having to deal with, but also Nazis. Now, of course, this takes place, uh, I want to say in 2019 is when all this takes place, if I'm not mistaken, or 20, 2018 maybe. Uh, but it takes place in that year, whenever it was published. So I want to say 2018. But it also takes place in 1942, and then later on we get a second part of the season, or season two, that takes place in 1876, with a really surprising villain that I was like, oh, that's where we're going to go with this. Uh, so Richard Starkings is able to do this really nice world building, introducing us to these monster hunter characters, introducing us to the idea, you know, that Nazis were summoning demons. So I really enjoyed the story, but what I really fell in love with was Abigail's artwork. I have never seen it before, and she's got this beautiful painted style that it seems rough around the edges, but the more you take a step back, the more beautiful it just becomes. I love this. This, this the characters were really well written. 
and I love the character designs. I love the panel flow. I can see where there might be some confusion, though, when, when it comes to action sequences, uh, because sometimes it is a little hard to follow the action sequences. But to me, the, the flow of the panel is what really carries the story. I think for somebody whose art I've not seen, and she very well could, you know, have drawn a bunch of issues under her belt. I don't know. Uh, I think she did a phenomenal job. So this is what the artwork looks like. This is the second season, and season one looks like this. So it's a very solid story. Oh, yeah, I forgot to mention that the character of Ali Zarin also plays an important part in this. He's kind of the one that lured her through the gate. He's kind of like their leader. But, again, this book retails for $29.99. It has 312 pages. In the back is where you're going to see some character designs. So original concept sketches, like the characters. Yeah, the whole Ask for Mercy is when she was pretty much calling like a bunch of her clients and leaving messages on their phone number saying, well, don't forget to ask for mercy because she's the realtor. So there's Ali Zarin and Siggeist. But there's Budgie. These are early designs for some of these characters. Ratmir. Kasa. And they all have their own unique powers I didn't even talk about. And the more you read this, the more you find out. And then the bio on these two wonderful creators. So I'm hoping to see more because it does leave for a lot more of this particular series. But this is Ask for Mercy, Volume 1. Last, but certainly not least, is Powers, Volume 3. So this is the latest printing of the Brian Michael Bendis stories. This has been previously released. I believe these issues in here have been collected in an omnibus format. And this is a brand new cover, though, by Michael Avon Oming. And I, I know they were collected in oversized format, too. So this right here collects issues 25 through 37 of Powers. And pretty much this is kind of separated into two different stories. Uh, we have the first story right here, which is pretty much the character that's kind of like your Superman character out of the Justice League, decides that he's pretty much just tired of being Superman, right? Being the whole symbol for truth, justice in the American way. So he decides to kind of do some disastrous things. And it pretty much ends up setting up the second story in here. Uh, because there's all kinds of setup for what's happening. You know, we're still learning about the backgrounds of the two detectives. And here, let's move on to the second story arc right here. And their connections to each other. This is a really fun issue right here with this uh, story. So the second story pretty much fleshes out the character of Christian Walker. And the origin of Christian Walker. How long he's been around. And it's just... A story that I didn't see coming. I had not read this story since I read it originally in trade paperback format. So it's been a long time since I read uh, this these particular stories. And I forgot that this is the volume that I really enjoyed. So there is mature content in this with violence and sexual content. But this to me I feel like is the big turning point for the series. Just keep on going because... From the last I remember, there were a couple of more twists and turns that happened in the pre, uh, in the next two volumes that will come later. And that, that's where I ended up, I think I stopped reading Powers. So this is really cool. This is a story early in Bendis and Oming's collaboration. Uh, Powers first appear in a book called Total Sellout. So it's presented here for the first time for the Powers collectors. So it's all in black and white. It's only four pages. And then we get to the cover gallery back here. So this is issue 29, issue 31, 32. I love that cover. And this is what all the covers look like together. So you also get the cover sketches and inks. A interview right here with Michael Avon Oming talking about how he pretty much lays out the plans for drawing powers. And then the script right here of an issue of powers for anybody interested in drawing their own comic. I always say use this as kind of a practice tool. 
draw what you see written on the script here and here's some gallery behind the scenes and pretty much some I don't not, not really house ads some pinups by different artists some pinups back here I'd like to know the story behind that and sketches there's a couple I had to skip because you know uh, boobies so this tells you a little bit about Brian Michael Bendis and a little bit about Michael Avon Oming and what other books that Dark Horse has been putting out so this particular volume has right around 500 pages and it retails for $29.99 and that as they say is that if you're interested in purchasing any of these books don't forget to check out our sponsor CheapGraphicNovels.com, your online home for graphic novels and collected editions up to 50% off cover price. They have excellent shipping and prompt and helpful service. Check out their bargain deals for up to 90% off cover price. And don't forget that CGN also takes pre-orders. That way you don't miss out on the hottest releases. And they are currently running a special promotion for you Minties. If you're a first-time customer, after receiving your order confirmation email, reply back to that email and let them know Near Mint Condition sent you their way. They will then apply a free shipping promotional credit to your next order in the US. Cheap Graphic Novels, your source for the hottest books with the kind of deep discount, quality shipping, and customer service that will keep you coming back for more. And that was the content and page count of each of these books. Let me know in the comments down below which ones you're picking up, which ones you've read, which ones you already have in Omnibus. Well, no, that one was an oversized. No, that was an Omnibus. It was part of the Omnibus. Uh, which ones you have in a hardcover, which ones you read through Comixology, and what you think of this series right here. And if you own, like, the previous printing of Air, which came out through Vertigo, I believe. But yes, I would love to know all those answers, so leave them in the comment section. If you yourself have any questions, by all means, leave them in the comment section. And my favorite thing to ask is, which of these books would you rebuy if they were to give us like a library edition of Air or a big hardcover collection of Powers? But anyway, leave those comments down below. Smash that like button. Hit subscribe if you haven't subscribed yet. Everyone stay healthy and safe out there. Much love.